Jay Sheehan. I am uh, now living in St. Paul. I've been asked to come down here in Elver Lee uh, to talk to you about my service and the service of the 5th Minnesota Company C during the Civil War, which we, you call the Civil War, we call the War of Southern Rebellion. Um, it's now been 35 years since the war ended. Some of these memories are not as strong as they used to be. I'll do the best I can to remember uh, what I can. I came to Freeborn County in 57, 1857, from Illinois. I originally came out of Ireland as an orphan. I come to Freeborn County, I had some relatives here. When I first got here, I got a parcel of land next to a fellow that you may have heard of named George Rupel. I worked for George that winter. Um, we had an arrangement that all the timber I could find, didn't know where I got it from, in the spring, he had a sawmill of course, in the spring he cut the timber for the lumber and I'd get a, a portion of that based on what I brought in. And it worked fine, I brought a lot of timber in that fall, that winter, and in the spring when he cut and we go for the, the our, our um, arranged uh, reimbursement, he shorted me on the timber. And I thought that was kind of a crooked deal. He kind of laughed and said, well, that's all you're going to get. I said, well, that's fine. Most of it came from your land anyway, George. So he later on denied that story, but it's, it's one of those funny moments in, in time. Following that, I worked as a clerk for the county, Freeborn County. I was elected in 61 again. The war, of course, broke out in spring of 61. As a young man, I determined to help save our union. And so I joined in October of 61, along with Fred, Frank Hall, who I had worked until here. We joined Company F of the 4th Minnesota and went to Fort Snelling. We were both elected by the men as corporals and distributed, uh, showed some leadership qualities. We were offered commissions in the newly forming 5th Minnesota if we could raise a company of soldiers in a month. We agreed, um, discharged in January of 62, came home, Frank and I set up a recruiting office in Argus Armstrong's law office, lawyer here on, on Broadway. And we sure enough recruited 80 men from Freeborn and Federal counties. We then traveled to Fort Snelling, mustered into service, Company C, 5th Minnesota, February 28, 1862. I was given commission first lieutenant, Frank Hall's commission as captain. We then proceeded to train in March and April, and then were ordered to Fort Ripley. Company B was ordered to Fort Ridgely, Company D ordered to Fort Abercrombie. Now, understand that we didn't join to go babysit some Indians on the frontier, but that's what these forts were. They were the frontier forts along Indian reservations in Minnesota at that time. We had joined to go fight the rebels down south, but we were sent to the frontier forts. And it was common at that time when the war broke out, the newly formed regiments in Minnesota went to the frontier forts. First Minnesota briefly in June of 61, the second uh, went until fall of 62, 61 rather. The fourth Minnesota then sent companies out in the winter of 64, 61. Then in the spring of 62, it was the fifth Minnesota's turn to send regiments or companies to the front. And we went to Fort Ripley. Fort Ridgely sits on the lower agency, Lower Sioux Agency, at the right below the reservation. In June of that year, the Indians were gathering for their annuities. The Indian agent, Major Goldreth, at the time, was concerned that there were too many non-annuity Indians coming into the upper agency, and he requested more troops. The only troops in the area were Company B, the 5th, at Fort Ridgely. So we were ordered, well, myself, well, a platoon of soldiers from Company C, from Fort Ripley down to Fort Ridgely. And in June 19th of that, of that year, we marched down to Fort Ridgely. It took us 10 days, got down there. I was immediately ordered with a platoon of Company B to the upper agency. That's where the Indians were gathering for their annuities. We marched up the river. We took a lot of 12 pound mountain officers. Fort Ridgely, if I can digress briefly, was established in 1853. By 1857, it is a artillery training post. So artillery units are coming through their training up um, on, on cannon, on light artillery. The ordnance sergeant in command that would stay with the ordnance, stayed at the fort, was Ordnance Sergeant Jones, John Jones, of the regular army. 
ordinance department. He had five cans in there. So there were two mountain howitzers, a six pounder, a 12 pounder, and a 24 pounder. That's what we had for ordinance at the fort at that time. When we went to the lower agency, we took along one of those 12 pound mountain howitzers. During April, May, and June of that year, uh, Company B was at Fort Ridgely drilling and training. Now there's only so much training you can do with the company at, at that time. So they got trained up with company tactics, but not having a regiment to drill with, there's only so much they could do. Sergeant Jones, in order to kill the time, trained up three or four squads, crews of these men on the cannon, which turns out to be a fortuitous thing. So when we went up to the lower agency uh, with this gun, we had a crew of men that knew how to operate this gun. We got up there 1st of July, and sure enough, there were huge numbers of Indians gathered around the fort, around the upper agency. The annuities were due. They were supposed to be coming in. The annuities are what the government paid the Indians for the purchase of their land. There was, as we found out later, a big discussion in Congress as to how they're going to pay. Normally, they paid in gold. With the war going on, the Congress wanted to pay them in this new paper money that was being printed. The Indians didn't want that. So there was a big discussion in Congress over this, how this is going to get paid. So the annuity payments are late. The Indians, of course, when they came in, assumed they would get their payments and be able to purchase the food they needed to eat. They didn't have much left. They're getting hungry, they're running out of food. Um, we marched up with just 15 days of rations. Our rations are starting to run out. They're after us to give them food. Um, every day they would, they would come around our camp and, and, and make demonstrations and hoot and holler and, and they would meet with myself and Lieutenant Gear, getting, trying to get us to give them food. We couldn't give them food because the, the, the food that was there was government stores controlled by the agents, the Indian agents. We had no control over that. All we had was our rations. In fact, by mid-July, I sent word back to Fort Ridge to send more another 15 days of ration. At that time, we also had a second mountain house brought up. So I had two mountain houses there and 100 men. The Indians would make these demonstrations every day, ride around our camp, hoot and holler, and, and make a big show of things. It, we got pretty much used to it, uh, seeing this these wild savages, as, they, as we called them at that time. Um, but we got used to it. Early August, they sent word, the Indians sent word to us that they were gonna have a bigger demonstration. And we've gotten so used to it, it didn't concern us much, uh, didn't really pay attention. That morning, on August the 4th, about 800 to 900 Indians mounted, most of them mounted, started circling our camp, uh, war paint, very definitely a different feel. Um, they then, one of their leaders went up to the government stores, threw his hatchet into the door, and that's when we realized what was going on. The Indians were going in to get that food. And there were probably four or 500 of them armed. They started capping their rifles. I immediately got my men in the line, as we were trained to do, at the ready. I didn't have them capped, because I didn't want it to, to burst into a fight. It was apparent they were not necessarily going to fight, they wanted to get the food. And about two dozen Indians that broke into the warehouse started getting food out. I immediately ordered Lieutenant Gear into action. He got one of the mountain pouncers in line, his crew ready, and aimed at the door. At that time, I marched a squad under Sergeant Trescott to the door, um, ordered them in to remove the Indians. They pulled the Indians out, got them out. I got Major Galbraith out and told him that we need to do something. These Indians are hungry. They're about to start a fight. And I, I've got 100 men, there's thousands of them. I'm, we're in bad trouble. Um, we called them down, we issued out some, some hard crackers, some hard, hard hardtack, and that seemed to calm the situation down at that time. Uh, Major Galbraith then informed me that my interpreter, uh, Quinn, that he didn't trust what he was saying to the Indians. He would not talk to him anymore. So he ordered him off of the agency grounds. I sent him back to Fort Ridgely along with Lieutenant Gear, asking Captain Marsh, Company B, to come back up to the up to the agency to help defuse the situation. I, as a lieutenant, didn't have the kind of control that a captain would. Captain Marsh came up, we met with a Galbraith, and fortunately he agreed that we need to issue some food to the Indians. We gave them some, what we had for hardtack, uh, a 
had some beef. And that seemed to diffuse the situation. Um, by the eighth and ninth, they started to leave the area, and pretty soon the Indians were gone. Uh, so we were ordered back to Fort Ripley, back to Fort Ridgely, rather. Went back to Fort Ridgely, and two days later, Captain Marsh then determined that I was, we were no longer needed. So ordered myself, along with Company C, back to Fort Ripley. And so we marched out of Fort Ridgely on August the 17th. So we marched on the 17th for 20, 22 miles, and the 18th for 20 miles. I just sat down for our evening meal, got the fires going, when a rider came in, the horse all lathered up with a, a terse command from Captain Marsh. Return immediately, the Indians have broken loose, they're killing everybody at the floor agency. We were shocked, of course, immediately threw our, our, our coffee on the fire and marched and got ourselves geared up and headed back. We were part of between uh, Auburn and, and Glencoe, 42 miles out. We didn't have a wagon. We went through Glencoe as a farmer with a, a wagon full of wheat that we he wanted his wagon. He said, I can't get I can't get in my wagon, I'm loaded with wheat. Then cheerfully unloaded his wagon for him and we took his wagon. We loaded all our gear onto the wagon except for our rifles and 20 rounds of ammunition, headed back to Fort Ridge. Now keep in mind we already marched 20 some miles that day. We got back to Fort Ridgely the next morning, on the morning of the 19th, nine and a half hours, 42 miles. And a 24 hour period, we went over 60 miles on foot. That record has never been equal, by the way. We did it at a, at a dog trot, it was a trotting. We took a brief rest here and there, but we got back on the 19th. What we found was a terrible situation. On the 17th, when we left, the Indians had a couple of their uh, young men had killed some people out in Acton. Uh, they had gone back to their camp and decided to attack the war agency. And they started killing all the traders and people at the war agency. The people that weren't killed started streaming into Fort Ridgely, telling the Captain Marsh, Company B, what was going on. He immediately formed up half of his company, 46 men, and headed towards the lower agency to find out what's going on to stop it. By the time we got back, he had not returned. Lieutenant Gear was in command of the fort, and he had just 29 men there, and a portion of those were sick in the hospital. Lieutenant Gear is 19 years old. He had the mumps himself, by the way. He's got less than 20 effective men. So we're getting word back from the lower agency. Now the company B has been attacked. Half of those men are killed. They don't know where the rest are. Captain Marsh is dead and the situation is terrible. I've got 50 men, 20 men in Company B, and about 350 to 400 civilians are crammed into the fort. To call Fort Ridgely a fort, however, is a misnomer. You would think a fort would have walls or some sort of protective. No, Fort Ridgely, as, as most forts in the West were, were simply garrisons from which the Army could operate out of. There was a collection of buildings around a, a parade ground and no walls. Fort Ridgely is situated on a, a uh, bluff coming out over the Minnesota River. On the, all three sides of the fort, there's ravines that come right up next to the fort, within 100 yards of the fort. There's a wide open area to the west, but everything else has ravines coming right up next to where anybody could sneak up on the fort. Fortunately, uh, Captain Lieutenant Gear had sent word to uh, Galbraith and Lieutenant Fobbs, who had left a day earlier, Galbraith had gotten 50 uh, mixed bloods to join. They were mustering and heading for Fort Sinai to muster into the 10th of Minnesota. And they had gone towards St. Peter. Gear sent messenger after them to get them back. They came back the, the night of the, of the 18th, then they came back, 19th rather. Um, and then some of the men from Company B that were survivors finally got back to the fort. So by the evening of the 19th, I had, with 25 civilians, roughly 180 effective men at the fort. We didn't know it, but the Indians had gone down to New Ulm on the 19th to attack New Ulm. Uh, had they attacked the fort that morning when they gathered around the fort before we got there, they'd easy over on the fort. We spent that day building what, uh, barricades we could. 
uh, we didn't get much accomplished. The next morning then, uh, on the 20th, uh, Little Crow, we knew Little Crow, was out on the plains of the west with uh, his council. They were having a council. And I had my pickets out. I'm in charge of the fort by now, because Lieutenant Gear, being a second lieutenant, I'm first lieutenant, so I'm in command of the fort. Captain Marsh is dead. I'm in command. I put pickets out as per military regulations, and right afternoon, one o'clock, the pickets noticed the Indians were coming up to the western or northeastern ravine up close to the fort to begin firing. As pickets are supposed to do, that will alert the garrison to an attack coming. I immediately formed my men in line on the parade ground as we were trained to do. That time the Indians started lobbing arrows in and uh, Mark Greer from Elba Lee here received an arrow in his chest and was killed immediately. I realized at that point that this was not a, a smart thing to do, so I immediately uh, put the men in different corners of the fort. Now, Sergeant Jones being the ordnance sergeant, he had been there for five or six years. He knew this area quite well and I, and I was aware of that. He was a veteran. He had been in the Mexican War. He knew how to fight. I gave him command of the artillery. Sergeant Jones, you do what you must with this artillery. We've got three, four squads of, of men from Company B that trained on the artillery. Fortunately, he had done that. We placed two of the mountain howitzers in the corners of the barracks, to the north, east and northwest of the barracks. He placed his, his six pounder on the south end of the, of the parade ground. When the attack started, men manned those guns men from Company B and Company C then stationed, uh, stationed them next to the guns. And as the attack started, they would pull their guns out, fire across the front of the barracks, and a crossfire with, with a canister, devastating. And as they would wheel out, the infantry would wheel out and give them covering fire to wheel back in. Also placed men on Company C in the upper floor of the barracks with good shots sit up there and they had two men each to help reload. So they were up on top of the barracks firing down that ravine and the crossfire. On the other side of the parade ground, Sergeant Jones is very busy because they're coming up out of the ravines of that area. He's again firing his grape shot and his canister knowing where it's going to go. Jones, having been there for five years, had gridded out that whole area. He knew exactly where his rounds would land for each shot. So he was very well aware where he was firing. That fight continued most all day until nightfall. They had gained a, a took control of some log cabins to the west, to the north of the barracks. We got them out of there. Um, night came, the attack stopped. The next day, the 21st, they did an attack when it rained. And we spent the day building more fortifications we had to break through the roof of the, of the barracks to get up on top because they were trying to, uh, with burning arrows, trying to start that barracks on fire. But we didn't have enough water to keep that uh, damp, but we got um, dirt up there and covered the roof with dirt to keep them from getting that. That's what we did on the day of the 21st, spent the time, and we also then had to get out to the magazines, which are 200 yards out from the fort, to bring the ammunition back in. Obviously, we needed that ammunition. As it turns out, Company C, my men, we had 54 caliber rifles and had absolutely no ammunition at the fort. The ammunition was there, 69 caliber, which worked for Company B's men. We had no ammunition. We took apart uh, cannon rounds using the powder, and we had uh, molds. We issued molds where you could remold their balls into 54 caliber leads, and that's how we. Uh, and then we made cartridges, the women made cartridges all day. Again on the 22nd, a similar thing, Little Crow out to the west. Uh, you can see the council, the idea, what he was trying to do was get us to go out after him so that he could attack the rest of the fort. We knew better than that. Again, on the, about one o'clock, they hit us, trying from all angles, coming up the ravines. Um, Sergeant Jones had placed a 12 pounder in the other corner, southwestern corner of, of the fort. So had four cannons working at that time. Um, late in the afternoon, you could see a large group of Indians forming to the west on the plains, about half a mile, mile out. And you could see them converging. Their intention was to go around to the southwest side to attack down there. 
that time, Sergeant Jones and myself, we determined that we need to break that attack. We pulled the 24 pounder out of park, dropped the round out there in the midst of them as they scampered down to the beans, dropped another round down there, and then to the southwest, dropped another round. Now, a 24 pounder, the net goes off, it's an amazing sound. That, that boom reverberated up and down the valley. In fact, we learned later citizens who all heard those guns, and that's 20 miles away. That 24 pounder, and that dropped in there. Of course, the Indians, what they were using was exploding shell. The Indians called those exploding shell rotten balls. They burst over the top of their head, rain shrapnel down on the enemy. But that 24 pounder, when that left loose, that ended the attack. So that was on the 22nd. The next four days, we're hunkered down, basically in siege. We didn't get attacked, we knew they were out there. I had sent messages to Fort Snelling, come back, come help us, we're, we're in trouble here. We knew that there were some regiments being formed, the sixth missile was being formed, but we had no idea if we were getting any help. We didn't know is that Governor Ramsey had, had a commission um, simply as a colonel, and he was forming a relief force based on the 6th uh, Minnesota and several mounted rangers, civilian rangers. Uh, the 28th, uh, Colonel McPhail came in with a relief force of about 170 mounted men. The next day, Colonel Sibley came in and the siege was, was relieved. We hadn't slept in a week. When those relief forces came in, my men of Company C and men of Company B literally fell over on the parade ground asleep except for a day. It was, it was that, that week was a harrowing week. <coughs> On the early part of September now, Sibley is, is forming his forces to chase the Indians up the Minnesota River. But I'm still garrison commander of the fort. I'm the, uh, the, the fifth Minnesota company B and C is the garrison at that point, so I'm still in command. Early September, um, Sibley sent out six, a couple companies of six Minnesota with some mounted rangers looking for bodies, burying bodies out in the plains from all the uh, atrocities that happened. We heard some firing September 3rd, I think it was, uh, to the north, uh, west of the fort. Um, I went out along with Colonel McPhail uh, and a, a company of men, mounted men. We got close to a place called Birch Cooley and we could hear firing going on. And I then rode back towards Fort Ridgey to get relief help. It's seven miles back, the Indians chased me all the way firing at me, but I managed to make it back. Um, they get the relief force, simply sent the men up, and the siege of uh, Birch Cooley was then done. Another terrible fight. End of September, simply has gone uh, north along the Minnesota River, chasing Indians. I'm ordered back to Fort Ripley with my men. We go back um, in December of 60. 62, we ordered to Fort Snelling, Company B. Uh, the men that's left Company B join us at Fort Snelling. We go south to join the, our rest of our regiment that had already gone south, uh, just north of Vicksburg. We got down there in January. We spent January, February campaigning through western Tennessee. Um, by March, April of that year, we're Part of a force that's approaching Vicksburg from the north. Now, Grant's trying to get into Vicksburg. Vicksburg is the key to the Mississippi River. His objective is to take Vicksburg. We approach Yazoo River and have some a, a, a fight with the rebels. We can't get through. We're stopped there. Grant's waiting for more reinforcements and more supplies, and we, we sit. And we're along a place, um, a Wellington Bend. It was here that. General Grant had this bright idea that he could dig a canal from the Mississippi River to an internal bayou to bypass Vicksburg with, with uh, our riverboats. So here we are. Now, the men of 5th Minnesota Company, see my men, had been farmers. So here we are digging a canal in mud up to our knees with a spade. The most, the most inglorious work you could think of, it didn't take anybody brains to realize that this wasn't going to work. It was a dumb idea, but orders are orders. Of course, what happens is, is uh, April, the Mississippi River, the, the river goes down, so the, the 
to hide the uh, rivers below the canal, because obviously it was a dumb idea, it wasn't going to work. The Navy then ran their gunboats past Vicksburg. We managed to get boats past Vicksburg, south of Vicksburg. Now we can get across the river. We make a hard march to the interior of Louisiana around Vicksburg, so the rebels didn't know we had, had done this maneuver. Uh, early May, we get to the south of Vicksburg, ferried across the river, Grant's Army. Now we make a mad dash toward Jackson. We know we have to get to Jackson uh, before we're able to go over south of, the, of Vicksburg. We drop everything. Three days rations, no supply trains other than ammunition trains for Jackson. Uh, second and third day out, 5th Minnesota is in front of the entire army. Uh, 16th, 15th Corps, we're, we're the lead skirmish unit. Normally a skirmish unit is out in front. What you're doing is you're finding where the rebels are, your, your enemy. Once you hit the rebels, you can fall back, the main body can come up. We just kept moving. Normally that skirmish unit would change every day. The uh, evening of the 13th, uh, General Tuttle came by and said, well, you boys did so well, we'll put you out there again tomorrow. Now, by that point in the war, we weren't so susceptible to compliments like that as we had been early on, but we did what we were told, so the next day, yes, we were again the lead skirmish unit. We get to Jackson, it's a stiff fight. We take Jackson, um, we spent that next day there as provost guard destroying the railroad tracks. Grant heads toward Vicksburg. The next day, then, we follow Grant. Um, on the 19th, he tries a frontal assault on Vicksburg, which doesn't work. He spends the next couple days getting more men, more reinforcements. The 22nd of May, he determines he's going to front the assault to take Vicksburg. Second Brigade, which was our brigade, uh, Third Division, 15th Corps, we get the honor of being one of the lead units advancing on the Confederate works. 11th Missouri, we were brigaded with uh, 11th Missouri, 8th Wisconsin, 47th Illinois, the 2nd Iowa Light Artillery. As we advance in the brigade front, the abatis, the trees that are down, are too thick, we can't get past, so we march by the flank, which means the 11th Missouri is over here, we're here, the 8th and 47th are behind us. We all fold in behind that lead regiment, go through this opening in the trees. The 11th Missouri is in the lead, and they got hit. Confederate uh, canister from both sides, it melted down into their corners. It was just destroyed, disseminated. But we got down behind the trees then that day. It was horrendous. The Confederate bombardment came at us. That night, we performed a new military maneuver. It's called Advanced Sideways. Got the hell out of there. I don't know if there were anybody else ever used that maneuver, but we used it and got out of there. And Grant decided then that that was not going to work, so uh, we then moved north of Vicksburg again along the Yazoo. We had a couple good fights there. Dick Taylor was starting to approach Vicksburg from the west, uh, relieving the siege. We got over to the other side of the river to stop him, and we spent the rest of June on the west side of the river opposite Vicksburg. Vicksburg fell July 3rd. We entered July 4th. And that was the end of the siege of Vicksburg. The rest of the summer we spent in Mississippi, uh, various campaigns, trying to catch the Confederates, had some fights. Um, went into camp on the Big Back River uh, late October, November. I came home at that time while Sergeant Prescott uh, had recruited. We had lost so many men due to fights and, and uh, disease that we were pretty low on, on men. I came home in November of 63 then. Winter of 63, 64, we spent again along the Grange, um, some fights, but largely in camp. In the spring of 64, um, after Vicksburg, we had been reassigned to the 16th Corps. So we're now 2nd Brigade, 1st Division, 16th Corps under A.J. Smith. General Banks and his Grand Army from uh, uh, out of the Gulf decided they're coming up. They want to go up the Red River and destroy Banks. General um, Taylor's army, but he wants more troops. So he requests the 16th Corps. We're sent down to help Banks and his grand excursion up the Red River. When we get down there. We have to wait for about a month for Banks to get there. Finally, he comes with his great army, and they are great. They got their brand new uniforms, 
brand new rifles, everything you need, this huge supply chain, and up the river they go. Now, we haven't been issued in, in six months. We're pretty ragged. They call us Fisk Girl. It's in pretty, pretty tough shape. So we thought, well, now there's a grand army. They're just going to fight like this. Not so. All the way up the Red River, they would hit the Confederates. The Confederates would beat them. We'd have to go up 16th Corps and defend them. We get up and all the way back. So Banks is now retreating. 16th Corps, again, covers his butt, wins every fight. And we're in about 12 or 15 fights, just in that one uh, campaign alone. One every one, they're forced to retreat. All the way back down the Red River. June 64, up to, up to uh, Vicksburg. Then in February of that year, we had re-enlisted. Men that wanted to re-enlist had re-enlisted. But part of their re-enlistment is they would get a 30-day furlough. Uh, July of, June, July of 64, those then men came home for the 30-day furlough. I stayed south with the people, the men that hadn't re-enlisted. Uh, we had some fights in southern Mississippi. Um, August, September of that year, the veterans come back. Now we're going to chase General Price across Arkansas, trying to catch him. So uh, September, November, October, we go across Arkansas. We run out of food. Our rations are bad, so we're on half rations and down to no rations. There was nothing out there to even eat. They didn't even know there was a war going on out, out there, some of the people. Uh, back up, come across Missouri, uh, November of 64. One day, a uh, 12 inch snowstorm hit us. Of course, we're from Minnesota. Another one of those things. Back to St. Louis now. Uh, General Thomas is facing Hood in Nashville. He wants veterans, so he's requesting the 16th Corps. We got river boats head for Nashville. First day out, our boat sinks. <laughs> Again, we get to Nashville, December 64, there's a, a heck of a river, uh, uh, ice storm, but finally Hood is around Nashville and, and Thomas decides to attack. Now the 5th is there, by this time the 9th has joined us. 7th and 10th Minnesota are different uh, brigades, but they're there as well. The first day on the 15th, we pushed the Confederates back up onto two hills. On the 16th, we were ordered to take the hill, which is now known as Shy's Hill. We advance across that field into a hellacious gunfire. They've got their artillery on top of the, of the hill. We get to the base of the hill, but the Confederates' error was they didn't put their guns on the military crest. Their big guns were too far back, they couldn't depress them down onto the hill. So we got up the hill, took the hill, and the only time a Confederate army left the field in total disarray, and we smashed it. The 5th and the 9th took the hill at the same time. The 5th, we always claim we took it first, the 9th says they did, whatever. Um, we lost, the 5th Minnesota lost 106 men in that charge. Three color bearers were killed, six were wounded. As we crested the hill, I grabbed the colors and find the colors at the top of the hill. Lieutenant Gear of Company B, who by that time was the adjutant, captured the flag of the 4th Mississippi and the 30th Georgia Infantry. For that, he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. He escorted those flags to Washington. We chased Hood uh, down into Alabama. They were ordered in, in April of 65 south to, out to Mobile. Uh, we fight at Spanish Fort, take Spanish Fort, Fort Blakely, the Confederate surrender, the war is over. We spent that summer in, uh, around Dermopolis, Alabama, as Provost Guard. Uh, we were uh, ordered home September 1st. We got home September 6th, Fort Snelling mustered out. I was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel at that time, so I mustered out as Lieutenant Colonel. That's why men have called me Colonel Sheehan the rest of my days.